Good morning. If you will, take your Bibles and open them with me uh, to Genesis 43. In Genesis 43, we have found ourselves in the middle of a saga. The saga of Joseph and his brothers and his father Jacob and how God is working out his plan using them uh, during very difficult circumstances. There has been already seven years of abundance and in those seven years of abundance God has revealed to Joseph uh, that there's seven years of famine coming. Joseph has prepared and now Joseph is the one who is helping the whole world survive the famine. Ultimately, though, God is bringing his people through the famine. Uh, and in it, God is, again, working his plan that started all the way back before the foundation of the world. But as we see it from Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman coming, which will ultimately be fulfilled in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Um, so here, there, there's a great struggle in uh, Canaan and in the nation of Israel becoming more and more like the Canaanites. So what we're going to see is that God is taking them out of the promised land. He's taking them out of Canaan and he's bringing them into Egypt. And in Egypt, they will stay there for 400 years. Say, so why would God do that? He's forming a nation and he wants them to be uh, pure. Not, I mean, they, he wants them not to intermarry with the Canaanites, not to intermarry with the Egyptians. And one of the things that would happen in Egypt, and we'll see in this chapter, is that the, the Egyptians were very much more segregated than any other nation on earth. They believed that all Egyptians uh, were descended from the gods and that everyone else in the world was of lesser origin. Even so, we're going to see in this chapter that Joseph, even though he's second in command, wouldn't eat, he couldn't eat with Egyptians. Um, that they, they saw themselves segregated. We're going to see even when uh, J Joseph's family comes to live in Egypt, They're, they don't live inside of Egypt. They live in Goshen outside, um, segregated. But God used all of this. To fulfill his plan. Remember, we've said this often. God's will is going to be carried out exactly on God's timetable. Nothing that people do is going to stop God's will from happening or to slow it down or accelerate it. God is sovereign. However, the free will that we have is either to submit to God and actively participate in his will being accomplished or to rebel against it. Now that being said, my rebellion or my submission will affect me and the descendants from me, how I experience my little time here on earth. But it will not stop God's plan from being accomplished. So we're in chapter 43, uh, the sons of Israel have gone to Egypt to get bread once. Uh, Joseph recognized them. They did not recognize him. He called them spies and put Simeon in jail and told them to come, not to come back until they bring Benjamin with them. All the while, uh, the sons of Jacob are describing themselves as honest men even in the middle of lying, saying that their brother, their, their, that Joseph is dead. But in it, we start to see God's work happening. God starting to deal with their conscience when they start to talk with each other about that we're guilty and that this is happening to us. God is doing this to us. And so conviction is happening. And, uh, bringing things out into the open. So if you haven't already read 43, read it now, and then we're going to pray.
Father God, I love you. Thank you so much, Father, for this book of beginnings. Father, there's these questions that every thinking person has. Where, where did we come from, Father? Uh, what is our purpose in life? Where did truth and morals and right and wrong come from? And where are we going when we die? All of these questions are answered right here in this book of beginnings. And so, Father, some of these answers we don't especially like. But, Father, may we renew our minds with the fact that you are God. You are in the heavens. You, you do whatever you please. Give us ears to hear. Give us, Father, soft hearts. Give us wills that will be compliant and submissive to you. Help us in this endeavor today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do you see every chapter, and even sometimes in the middle of the chapters in Genesis, how when Moses writes, he starts a new scene with the word now. Now, So that, that helps you uh, when we're getting into it. We're in narratives, and there's a new scene in the narrative. Uh, remember the difference. There's narrative and commentary in the Bible. Um, so we keep going back to the book of Psalms. Psalms are songs, and they are narrative. I mean, they are commentary on what is happening in the narrative. And so, um, remember, the commentary should give us greater understanding about what is going on in the narrative, what is prescriptive and what is descriptive, and how we can grow in applying this to our own lives, even some 5,000 years later. Um so, now the famine was severe in the land, and so it came about when they had finished eating the grain which they had brought from Egypt that their father said to them, Go back, buy us a little food. <laughs> uh, now you can imagine, remember, uh, Joseph knows how long the famine's going to last. Jacob, however, doesn't, and he may have thought, we got enough food to get through this thing. Simeon's going to have to deal with his own thing down there. Um, I'm not sending my son down there. That's what he said. And so the famine, though, persists and has lasted uh, longer. And we know that this is in, probably in the second year of the famine. And there's not enough food. And so what's happening is we see... Uh, he says, go back. And you can imagine, uh, in my mind, I do, Jacob praying, God, please stop this famine. Uh, but the famine is part of God's plan being laid out. And it always reminds me of Romans 8, 26, where it says, we don't know how to pray. Uh, but the Spirit prays for us with groans that can't be uttered. Uh, so I think I know what's right. So our prayers should not be, uh, instruction to God. It should be asking for instruction from him, asking for strength and courage in carrying out his will. Um, verse 3, Judah spoke to him, however, saying, the man solemnly warned us, you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you send your brother with us, if you send our brother with us, we will go down and buy you food. But if you do not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, you will not see my face unless your brother is with you. Then Israel said, why did you treat me so badly by telling the man whether you still had another brother? Again, where is Jacob's focus? On himself. But they said, the man questioned particularly about us. And our relatives saying, is your family still alive? Have you another brother? So we answered his questions. Could we possibly know that he would say, bring your brother down here? You would think that at some point, the brothers of Joseph would start to put two and two together. But it doesn't appear that they ever do. Remember, they have such a low view of their brother that they sold him into slavery. They couldn't even fathom that he would become 
this guy that's in charge of food distribution to the whole world. However, verse 8 really reveals some change in the life of Judah. Up to this point, think about what we've been told about Judah. First, uh, Judah is the one who comes up with the idea to sell his brother into slavery. Next, we read about Judah uh, not teaching his sons really about the Lord. And then we see him mistreating his daughter-in-law, Tamar. We see him going into prostitutes. We see him then at the end when he's confronted with his sin, when he sees it clearest in Tamar, we see him saying and understanding that he is not righteous. It says here, Judah said to his father Israel, send the lad with me and we will arise and go that we may live and not die. We as well as your little ones, as you and our little ones. I myself will be surety for him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame before you forever. For if you, if you had not delayed, surely by now we could have returned twice. We do see a change in Judah. Um, it's interesting to me that Satan is trying to stop God's plan. He understands, because God has stated it very clearly, that he is forming a nation out of Jacob. And so Satan is trying to stop it. But Satan doesn't know everything. God hasn't revealed all of that. Uh, God hasn't yet shown which son he's going to work through. Uh, obviously, as Satan looks at it, he thinks that God's going to work through Joseph. Or God's going to work through Benjamin. Uh, that's why all of his vitriol has been going on to Joseph. Yet, the one that God is going to use is Judah. The wicked man Judah, but the man who's confronted with his sin and repents of his sin and God changes him. Great word of hope for every one of us. Verse 11. Then their father said, Israel said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Take some of the best products, and then he goes through um, his old tactics. If you'll remember back in chapter 33, where he's going to meet his brother, and he, he sends a great big gift ahead of time. So uh, he understands this idea, and, and he tries to, again, Jacob has no idea of what God's doing. He's thinking totally in the world's way. Um, what, what is devoid of anything in all these chapters, we hear them talking about God, but we never see anybody going to God. That's a big problem. Look at verse 12, though. It says, Take double the money in your hand, and take back in your hand the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks, Perhaps it was a mistake. So there's ten brothers, uh, and and so they're taking double back, so twenty. And I, I just see the the correlation between how much they sold their brother for twenty pieces of silver. The word silver and money here are the same Hebrew term. Um, just a side note of a. Hey, the same money that they sold their brother for is the same money that they're taking back to Joseph to try to get things right. Interesting. Um, verse 13 says, Take your brother also. Now, talking about Benjamin. Uh, if, if you can, can connect the end of verse, uh, the end of chapter 42 in verse 38, but Jacob said, My son. Now he's your brother. Um, just the emphasis here um, kind of reminded me of, you know, when, when my son was in trouble, my wife would call him my son. But, but if he was doing something great, it was her son. <laughs> we all do this kind of. Here, we see that kind of in Jacob. This is my son. Now, take your brother. 
um, emphasizing the different relationship. Uh, so take your brother also and arise, return to the man. And may God Almighty grant you compassion in the sight of the man so that he will release you, release to you your brother and Benjamin. But as for me, if I am bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. Now, he's talking about God here, but I hope you can see that it doesn't seem to be faith in God. This, is, this idea of, if I'm bereaved, I'm bereaved. Fatalism. There is a different, fatalism and faith are not the same. He's talking about God. Why doesn't he go to God? Just a question. So the men took this present, and they took the double the money in their hand, and Benjamin, and then they arose and went to Egypt, and stood before Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to his house steward, Bring the men into the house, and slay an animal, and make ready, for the men are to dine with me at noon. Um, a dinner. A reconciliation dinner. Um, it, it, it beckons me to all the way to the end of the Bible in Revelation chapter 3. When Jesus is confronting the different churches, he's confronting brethren, just like Joseph is confront, confronting brethren. And at the end, to the church of Laodicea, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone would come and open it for me, I would come in, commune, and dine with them. Um, interesting that they're back. They're going to dine with Joseph. Uh, so the man did as Joseph, verse 17, said, and brought the men to Joseph's house. Now the men were afraid because they were brought to Joseph's house. And they said, it is because of the money that was returned in our sack the first time that we are being brought in, that we may seek occasion against us and fall upon us and take us for slaves and our donkeys. Again, they're thinking that Joseph wants their material possessions. Why? Because that's all they ever wanted. They don't understand Joseph? How could they? They don't have the walk with God that Joseph has. Joseph is the one here trying to reconcile. God is trying to bring these uh, men to the place where they will actually be a part of it. Actively, though, in verse 19, they actively talked to the steward about what happened with the money. So they came near to Joseph's house steward. It, it's, it would be better to get this out in the open is what they come to. Let's try to talk with the steward, and maybe he will be on our side, and he knows more about the in workings of the house, and we could get the truth out there. Uh, they spoke to him at the entrance of the house and said, Oh, my Lord, we indeed came down the first time to buy food. And it came about when we came to the lodging place that we opened our sacks, plural, and behold, each man's money was in the mouth of his sacks, our money in full. Again, we talked about this yesterday. Remember when they, when they got to their father's house, they acted like they hadn't found out about the money. They were, uh, again, not being quite truthful with their father. I believe they're being truthful to this steward because the, the steward knows all about it. Look what happens. It says, we have also brought down other money in our hand to buy food. We do not know who put our money in our sacks. The steward said, be at ease. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. So those last four words, I had your money, could mean a few different things. Um, he had your money and put it back into the bag. It could mean that. It could mean that he still had their money and that Joseph put his own money in there. I really believe that's probably what went on. 
Uh, Joseph wanted to make sure that all the grain was paid for. And so he pays his own money. Uh, another picture of Jesus Christ. Um, then he brought Simeon out to them. Um, you wonder about the year Simeon spent in jail. Did he learn anything? We don't know. It doesn't really say. The only time it really brings up Simeon again is in chapter 49, verses 5 through 7, when uh, Jacob's dying. And all he brings up is the fact that Simeon was involved in the slaughter uh, in Shechem over his sister Dinah. So we don't know. Verse 24, Then the man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water, and they washed their feet, and he gave their donkeys fodder. So they prepared uh, the present for Joseph's coming at noon, for they had heard that they were to eat a meal there. When Joseph came home, they, they brought into the house to him the present which was in their hands, and what? They bowed to the ground before him. This is another continuation of the last chapter. Because remember, it said all your brothers are going to bow. Now, Benjamin is with them now, so all the brothers are with him. It's not done yet because he had another dream saying, hey, your mother and your, your, your uh, father and mother will be here to bow down before you. Um, now, we know that his mother uh, is dead, but his stepmothers will come and and that's yet to be fulfilled. Verse 27, Then he asked them about their welfare and said, Is your old father well, of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? And they said, Your servant, our father, is well. He is still alive. And they bowed down in homage. And he lifted his eyes and he saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son. He said, Is this your youngest brother, of whom you spoke to me? And he said, May God be gracious to you, my son. And Joseph hurried out, for he was deeply stirred over his brother. And he sought a place to weep. And he entered his chamber and he wept there. Why is he weeping over his brother Benjamin? Remember the fi family dynamics. There's 12 brothers. Uh, all of them, before Benjamin comes, so... Ten against one, really, in hatred against Joseph. And when Joseph is sold into slavery, Benjamin is just a, an infant. And so the idea that, um, that he would have a brother, that he could have a brotherly relationship. You know that, that relationship where brother sticks up for brother Joseph had never experienced. His brothers, his half-brothers, sold him into slavery. And he longs for that relationship. Verse 31. Then he washed his face and came out. And he controlled himself and said, serve the meal. Not yet does he want to reveal himself to his brothers. Why? Again, trying to bring them to the point where they will confess their sin. So they served him by himself. And them by themselves, and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves. We talked a little bit about this, uh, the segregation uh, of the Egyptians. Uh, but really, all in God's plan to keep the nation of Israel segregated into the family of Abraham, even when there's a million of them 400 years later. Look what it says. It says... Uh, verse 33 now they were seated before him the firstborn to his birthright all the way to the youngest according to his youth and the men looked at one another in astonishment um, it, I was reading a commentary that said the odds of this happening are 1 in 40 million 1 in 40 million that you could take 12 or, or 11 I guess 11 brothers and seat them in order of their age and not mess it up. The, the different ways of different options in that. And uh, we should have given them an idea, and maybe it did, but we don't, uh, they don't 
seem to be biting on it, that this guy intimately knows this family. They were astonished. And he took portions of them, he took portions to them from his own table, which shows great care and love for them. Uh, but Benjamin's portion was five times as much as any of theirs. So they feasted and drank freely with him. This is a, kind of a bad place to break, but we're going to break here today. But imagine this. They're so afraid that something's going to happen to Benjamin and hurt their father more. Uh, God is trying to work out the hurt that they have given their father over their other brother Joseph. And God is reconciling them in the middle of his overall plan being carried out. But imagine the relief that they felt. They're in this uh, home and they're afraid at first that the man's going to be upset about the money. And it, no, it's not. And they're having a meal where he takes food off his own table and he brings it to them. But then the, the greatest relief when they see Benjamin getting five times more food than them. The relief of, for some reason, this man is taking a shine on our youngest brother. He doesn't want to kill him. And that was a big change. Because Benjamin was just as much a favored son as Joseph was. And they wanted to kill Joseph, but now they're trying to protect Benjamin. Which reveals a change in their heart, which we'll learn more about uh, in further chapters. So I pray that this study of the nation of Israel and its formation is helping us to understand the character of God, his grace and his mercy, but also his sovereignty. His plan will happen. The question for you and for me is, are we willingly submitting and actively participating in God's will or are we rebelling against it? It will affect the way we experience God in our lifetime and for all of eternity. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. May your spirit guide us today as he has guided Joseph. May we have forgiving hearts. May we look to be reconciled with others. And Father, may we be quick to confess and repent in our own lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.